Good morning. Uh, good to see you, and hopefully you can see me. Uh, and we're taking this week off, not because of COVID, uh, because of winter weather. Uh, the last few days here in Clarence have been pretty miserable. We've had inches of snow uh, last few days, and of course the the high, the, the temperatures in that zero or below range. So we decided to uh, call off in-service worship today which is why I'm putting this um, on the uh, church Facebook page. And I'm pretty sure we will go back to in-person service next Sunday with Destiny. And then if you have any questions about it, uh, give her a call or contact me. You can leave a note here on the Facebook page. And uh, we'll get back to what we were supposed to be doing, meeting in church. So um, again, it's great that we have this opportunity to use some technology. Uh, Today's Valentine's Day. I hope it's all a, a good one for all of you and your 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 spouse, your your loved one, your your special someone in your life. So I hope you can make a good day of it. And uh, my my words today are kind of based on love, which is the foundation of the Valentine's Day holiday. Uh, but uh, to keep with the the lectionary schedule, uh, I will read uh, this week's uh, New Testament passage, which is. Mark 9, 2 through 9. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was, transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And this is the word of the Lord. If I speak in tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but not do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Love never fails. But where are the prophecies? Where, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we now know in part, and we prophecy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part that I shall fully, even as I am fully known. And now these remain faith, hope, and love but the greatest of these is love. There was a man who only had an eighth grade education, but this man wanted to be a soul winner. God had laid a brilliant attorney on his heart. Obeying the Lord, he went to talk to the lawyer about Jesus Christ, but no sooner had he begun when the attorney used his legal training and brilliant mind to turn the man inside out. The man finally apologized for coming and for taking the attorney's time. He left with tears in his eyes as he said to the lawyer, I just want you to know that I came here because I love you. Dejected, he went 
home to his wife and said, I don't want to be bothered. I don't want to talk to anyone the rest of the day. I just want to go to my room and be left alone. I feel like such a failure. About an hour later, the lawyer came and knocked upon the man's door. He told the man's wife he would like to see her husband. She said, I'm sorry, but he's not seeing anyone today. Oh, he said, I think he will see me. Just tell him who I am. So the husband allowed the attorney to come into his room and said, Why have you come? Have you come to make fun of me? Have you come to argue with me again? You know I cannot argue with you. The lawyer said, No, I haven't come to argue with you. I have come to ask you to tell me how to be saved. The man replied, I don't understand. What changed your mind? Every time I tried to tell you about Jesus, you came up with an argument that I couldn't answer. The lawyer said, yes, I did, but you came up with an argument that I couldn't answer. The soul winner looked at him and said, what was that? The lawyer replied, when you looked at me and told me you loved me, I couldn't argue with that. Love, it's hard to win an argument when the other person is showing you love. That's probably why God tells us many times to love our enemies. Love is such a small word that holds so much meaning. In fact, if I asked each one of you what love means, you'd probably give me a different definition. So many feelings, emotions, and thoughts come to mind when one meditates on the word. And so in today's passage, Paul so eloquently tries to help us understand what love is and what's not, and how ver ver vitally important it is in our faith. As Jesus followers, we know that God is love and that we are called to love as Jesus loved. Sometimes it comes easily, naturally, enthusiastically. But I'd venture to say that, like me, you'd say that most of the time it's complex, messy, and confusing. Especially when we start listening to the world and what it has to say about love. The world gives us many distorted views on love. One distortion is that to love one another person, we have to accept and tolerate their bad behavior and sin. Phil Robinson, from the uh, popular TV show Duck Dynasty, said it well. Our culture has accepted two huge lies. The first is that if you disagree with someone's lifestyle, you must fear or hate them. The second is that to love someone means you agree with everything they believe or do. Both are nonsense. You don't have to compromise convictions to be compassionate. The Bible teaches us what true love looks like through the person of Jesus, and he definitely did not compromise his convictions in order to love people. When confronted with a sinner, he always told them to go and sin no more, and yet loved them unconditionally because many of them became his close followers. Proverbs 27, 5 and 6 states, Better is to open rebuke than hidden love. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. The world would have us believe that tolerance is more loving thing to do. Author Josh McDowell says it like this. Tolerance says you must approve of what I do. Love says I will do something harder. I will love you even when your behavior offends me. Tolerance says you must agree with me. Love responds, I will do something harder. I will tell you that, that truth because I am convinced the truth will set you free. Tolerance says, you, will, you must allow me to have my way. Love responds, I must do something harder. I will plead with you to follow the right way because I believe you are worth the risk. Tolerance seeks to be in, inoffensive. Love takes risks. Tolerance glorifies division. Love seeks unity. Tolerance costs nothing. Love costs everything. Tolerance can create a safe workplace, but it can never create a team because tolerance is not enough. Tolerance might be able to have a couple live together under the same roof, but it will never enable them to love and trust one another. Tolerance is not enough. Tolerance may be able to create desegregation laws in a society, but it will never eradicate racism from the hearts and minds of individuals because tolerance is not enough. The scriptures do not say, tolerate the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Tolerate your neighbor as yourself. Faith, hope, and tolerance abide. These three, but the greatest of them is tolerance. 
For God so tolerated the world that he gave his only son. Friends, let us tolerate one another, for tolerance is from God. In this tolerance, not that we tolerated God, but God tolerated us. This one word, which the world wants us to believe, defines love, totally changes the meaning of the scriptures, doesn't it? Loving people is as much harder job than tolerating them. But Jesus calls us to say, calls us to something much more meaningful, something that will actually change lives. I'll be honest, I struggle with knowing how to balance between tolerance and love. Everyone needs love, but also everyone has sins, issues, and problems to deal with. And so many of the times, my loving might come across as being too tolerant, as I have a hard time pointing out faults and sins in other people. And I fear that if I tell them that it may come across as being judgmental and perhaps even rude. There's a fine line, and Jesus got it right 100% of the time, which is why we need to follow his example. Paul's words gives us guidelines in how to act out love. One of the hardest ones for me is that love is patient. So once a person is told about their sin, love waits patiently for the person to repent. But the key is that love does not walk away from them, telling them that in order to be loved, they have to meet a standard or a condition. No, love is unconditional. It continues to love while waiting patiently. Perhaps we make love way too complicated. Could it be as simple as being authentic with people and sharing our lives with them? Perhaps if we were open and honest with them about our own personal struggles, then the line between tolerance and love would not be so hard to find. A book, Blue Like Jazz, by Don Miller, tells of him and his buddies setting up a confessional box in the center of the Reed College campus. Miller's confession, confessional worked in reverse. Students of Reed, which is a very liberal campus in the country, entered the confessional booth with curiosity, cynicism, skepticism, or worse, to disprove Christianity. But what they encountered upon entry was disarming, even healing. Rather than prompt to confess their sin, Miller sat on the other side of the veil and confessed his sins and the sins of the church. Many who heard the confessions were touched and asked Don and his friends about Jesus, and some were even saved in the confessional box. No, I'm not suggesting we set up a confessional booth in front of the church or even our own yards. That's pretty extreme. What I am suggesting is that in order to love like Jesus did, we need to open ourselves up to others and share our own struggles and sin so they will, that they will feel they are not alone. This will hopefully open the door to sharing Jesus, the true lover of all of our souls, to them. Someone has said, they will not care how much you know until they know how much you care. There, that is good news. I don't pretend to know much, but I do care, and so do you, and so together. I do believe we can make a difference in the lives of others by loving them the way Jesus does. Be with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, Thank you for your everlasting, faithful, and gracious love. We want to love like you do, without conditions, without judgment, and even without restraints. Help us to fulfill this, Lord. Amen. Thanks for the time. I uh, hope you can see and hear this well. Again, uh, we'll, I'm a pretty confident we will go back to in service on next Sunday, February 21st. Destiny will be there, so if um, you have any questions about the service, contact her or you can leave contact me as well. Uh, have a good week. God bless.